We are your summit co-chairs. I'm Dan Hong. And I'm Afua Bruce. One of the things we were planning to celebrate at Summit this year was Code for America's 10th birthday. We've heard consistently that Summit is a special event bringing together people who share the same goal of making government work in the digital age in an unparalleled way. And as Summit attendees, you're probably the kind of person who's committed to bringing new ideas and collaborating across old silos and doing the hard work for the long haul to change people's lives for the better right now. Over the past 10 years, Code for America and our partners have adapted and changed as we've learned more about what our colleagues, residents, and citizens need. And today, we're going to dig a little into how we need that same flexibility and creativity to make government work the way we deserve in March 2020. The summit was to cover four tracks, design and delivery, civic innovation and data, operations and management, and tech and policy. Today, we'll be starting our summit with a new session in our operations and management track. Look out for what we'll be scheduling over the coming weeks. As a preview, we'll be working with our breakout speakers to record their sessions and share them with you. And now over to Zarin Sarpangal, interim co-CEO of Code for America. Great, thank you all for joining us this morning. As you know, we canceled the 2020 Code for America Summit due to evolving concerns around the coronavirus outbreak or we'd be in Washington DC right now with more than a thousand of you on our mission to make government work in our digital age. And while we're not meeting in person, we're excited to learn how we can connect together in new ways and push our movement forward in a time where meeting people's needs is more important than ever before. Today's online session is just the first of more to come from Code for America over the coming weeks and months not just the keynotes, lightning talks, and sessions we were looking forward to sharing this week, but new ones too. So please stay connected as we announce more of our program at codeforamerica.org slash events. We also have had several generous folks reach out and say that they wanted to donate the value of their tickets to support our work. As a nonprofit, we truly appreciate and value that contribution. To that end, we're making it possible for attendees to choose a full or partial donation instead of an automatic refund before all refunds will be issued on March 20th. Please email us at summit at codeforamerica.org for any assistance. We also gratefully accept donations at codeforamerica.org slash donate. Your support enables our work all year round to continue to share content like today to provide the broader community with resources and connections. In addition, it allows us to work on and share learnings from our various programs, especially in the safety net and criminal justice space, and the work of our nationwide brigade volunteer network that helped transform how government can work in the digital age. I also wanna thank our sponsors and our partners for this year, New America. The work and powerful relationships that make Summit possible will translate into our year round work and we're excited to continue forging ahead, even and especially in uncertain times where our efforts can have the most impact. Thank you all for your support and for joining us on this morning's stream. I'll now turn it over to our 2020 Summit co-chairs, Afua Bruce and Dan Hahn again. Thanks Erin. So next up, a few important housekeeping points. Our code of conduct applies as much online as it does in physical spaces. We expect today's session to be a safe and respectful environment for everyone and a place where people are fully able to express their identities. We've included a link in the chat in Zoom if you'd like to review it. If you are being harassed or notice someone else being harassed or have any other concerns, please message Marissa or Javita using Zoom chat or you can also send an email to safespace at codeforamerica.org. Throughout this morning's session, you can submit questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our hosts and moderators will review and we'll try to answer as many as we can with our panelists in the final section of the conversation, as well as in follow-up content. We'll also be running polls as we go through. We also welcome your tweets, so find us at Code for America or use the CFA Summit hashtag. And stay tuned later this week for an email with the YouTube video of today's session, as well as a post at codeforamerica.org news with more of the resources, tips, and tricks you'll be hearing about. 
we'll also have a way for you to contribute your own suggestions to share with others. So let's get straight in and get started. As our fellow government workers and technologists around the world have been adjusting to a term that we're all learning of social distancing, we in the US are fairly new to this environment. As organizations, cities and government departments at all levels start shifting and making plans to move to remote work, how can we successfully navigate this unplanned change? And how do we support employees, maintain strong cultures and live up to our commitments to inclusion and ensure that we still get work done? Government and civic tech has its own context and own challenges to deal with as we move and plan the steps for successful remote distributed working. Our panelists will show us what's possible with great remote working practices, share candid advice on how to put those practices in place. We hope to keep the conversation going after this webinar. Now, you're not gonna learn about the best webcam or microphone for video conferencing. We're not even gonna talk about which video conferencing or collaboration software is the best, although we're sure some of you all out there will have your own opinions. There's a whole bunch of websites for that. What's important for long-term success is putting in place the right foundational practices and culture. In the end, we all know that tools don't matter as much as people. And it's also important to keep our sense of humor in times like this. So we're proud to bring together our first panel to discuss successful remote and muted work in uncertain times. Our goal today is to leave you with actionable insights that you can take back to your teams with clear next steps on starting and supporting a successful and healthy remote culture. So I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. In alphabetical order, joining us today are Leah Bannon, VA.gov Product Manager at the US Digital Service, Department of Veterans Affairs, and formerly of 18F. Robin Carnahan, 18F's former Director of State and Local Practice. Mark Furlap, Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder at Trust. And Laura Lanford, Vice President of Engineering at NAVA Public Benefit Corporation. So let's, let's just jump right in and let's get started off by talking about the basics. How, as a manager, do you support people? And are there any special considerations if you're in a matrix environment where people report to more than one person? Laura and Leah, why don't we start with you? So um, I'll go first. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Lanford from NAVA Public Benefit Corporation. Um, I'm the VP of Engineering here, but I've also been involved with that disaster preparedness as a volunteer for more than a decade uh, with a focus around pandemic preparedness. Uh, in fact, my roller derby name back in the day was Pam Dimmick. Um, there are a lot of us in the situation right now where we're being forced into working remotely. Uh, NAVA, luckily, is, uh, was started as a remote-friendly company, so we have a lot of the best practices in place already, but we also have a lot of people who normally work in offices who are now being forced to work at home. Um, I'd like to share the best practices that we've learned and are continuing to learn so that all of us can be more effective in the coming weeks. Uh, in the references section, there are a lot of recommendations on tools and other things, but I'd like to talk about the biggest underlying principle um, that NAVA uses for our remote workers. When people can't see you, and when people can't see you because you're not in the same room, you have to over communicate. When casual water cooler chat doesn't happen, you also have to be more deliberate about how you communicate. Some of the ways that we do it, uh, for clients, we create more asynchronous reference pages. There are confluence pages, JIRA boards, status reports, and a multitude of other ways for our clients to check the real-time status of the projects. Uh, for employees, we have structured, consistent one-on-ones. Our managers and their reports use shared documents over the course of a week to collect information so that those informal side conversations aren't lost. We use standardized questions like, what feedback do you have for your peers? What frustrations do you have this week? To balance out for that lack of day-to-day -day, uh, visibility. And for both clients and our employees, it can be tempting to call more meetings when you don't get to see people every day. So to counteract unproductive meetings, we're very deliberate about <clears throat> both providing as much asynchronous communication as we can, both before and in place of meetings and being very deliberate about using that meeting time well. Um, we ask people to provide an agenda and the expected outcomes of a given meeting so that when we do get together, um, it's as valuable as possible. Um, great, thanks, Leah. <laughs> thanks, Laura. Uh, Leah, do you have anything to add? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, this is kind of an interesting time as folks are like all doing it all at once because my biggest advice to folks when they're considering doing uh, distributed remote work is that it can't just be like an additional thing you add to a meeting that's mostly in person. Um, you need to kind of have that center of gravity focused on having the like virtual meeting, virtual meeting, I mean, it's a real meeting, right? Um, work for the people who are calling in, who are listening, who like, it's so important to be able to, like Laura was saying, see people's faces, be able to fully hear everyone. So a lot of times at ETF, um, when we started really pursuing distributed as a top priority, we would have everyone call in, even if they were in the room, have people call in with the video on their screen. Um, and then really approach it like you would any other um, technical thing that needs to work for humans, right? So you test it out and you work through all the little kinks ahead of time. Uh, I think it was Gray Brooks at 18F who even started a working group for this and he would get folks to call in and volunteer and work through all the kinks in our conference rooms and the technical tools and stuff. And we just kept working through it and iterating on it. Um, you know, we don't do big launches anymore, right? Like nobody does like big last minute launches. We test everything out slowly and iteratively first. And so it's the same thing when you're doing a big call like this, like we all gathered the day before to test through it and work through it all. So um, it's just, it's a process that you have to prioritize anytime uh, you're doing something new that involves technology. Great, thank you so much. I wanna give our other panelists, Robin and Mark, um, a chance to respond if you have anything to add on how you manage well, and if you have any tips, especially on how you successfully keep people engaged in meetings. I think people would enjoy hearing that. Yeah, thanks, this is Robin. Uh, I'm, I'm calling in from Missouri. Welcome everybody. Um, yeah, the, the question about how do you keep people engaged is a really great one. I would say, <laughs> First, keep your meeting short, have an agenda, stick to it, and then uh, ask for people to be engaged, right? So if you upfront say, hey, I'm gonna keep this short and honor and respect your time, uh, please do the same thing for your teammates. So I think being uh, intentional about that is really important. Um, at, at 18F, we always talked about a remote first mindset. And I wanna give a shout out to some uh, former colleagues um, uh, Melody Kramer and Michelle Hertzfeld, they did a great blog post, if y'all are interested, uh, called um, uh, remote, how, to, how to Have an Effective uh, uh, Remote Teams. Um, you know, one of the things I think is important, and Leah mentioned it, is not just having the tools, but making sure everybody can use them. And so having real training so people are comfortable with the, the, the document sharing or video conferencing or other things. Uh, the other thing, in addition to just having agendas, is to make sure there are notes that are being taken, just something as simple as that, and have someone in the meeting volunteer to do that so that it's not the same person stuck taking notes all the time, but it also is a terrific reference for folks who can't make the meeting. So the idea that you're documenting everything, having really clear next steps, who's responsible, timelines, all that. One of the other things that was new to me when I joined 18F was the idea about stand-ups. I know folks in the, in the developer world have done that for a long time, but that notion that you can have a quick, easy way to check in on progress, tell people what you did yesterday, tell them what you're going to do today, and, and identify blockers. And those can be done either in real time or they can be done uh, uh, just on, on Slack or some other communication tool. And I guess one last thing is, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit more, is that, um, you know, we, we try to encourage casual conversations. You know, that's one of the things that we all love about being at an office is being around our colleagues. Uh, so we had like virtual coffee bots that can make it really easy to set up 30 minute coffees with folks or do happy hours. Um, uh, so I'd encourage you all to think about ways to just sort of integrate these technology tools into people's lives so they feel like they're interacting a little bit more. Thanks, Mark? Robin. Mark? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Mark from Trust. We're a, we're a fully distributed organization, so we don't have a central office. Um, the things we found around management that have been really effective are the 
the managers need to kind of enforce the norms of doing everything remote in a distributed way. Um, for example, one of the things we do that we found to be extremely powerful is if anybody isn't in the room, nobody's in the room. So we don't have, we don't use conference rooms if we have a meeting, like if there's three people in one space, we're all independently on whatever tools the people who aren't in the space are using, be it, you know, Zoom or Slack or whatever. Um, another example of a technique that we found that's really effective is for note taking using um, collaborative note taking tools so that multiple people can be taking notes at the same time and trading off throughout the meeting so that whoever is talking doesn't have to, so whoever, whoever is taking notes can stop when they have something con to contribute to the conversation. Um, as far as keeping people engaged, for small meetings, everybody should be engaged. The collaborative note taking and like it's small and tight and focused. For larger meetings, like, a, like our all hands meeting, we do an all hands every week to keep everybody up to date with what's going on with the company. Um, we actually actively encourage uh, what we call the back channel. So we'll have a channel in our Slack instance that people will be able to comment on what's talking about and you know make jokes and post a funny picture that's relevant or whatever. And it helps keep everybody focused on what we're actually saying, um, kind of counterintuitively, because if you want to, you know, people like to be able to like crack a joke or like comment on stuff and, and it just helps keep people very, very focused. And so we tend to do that for all of our large, uh, all of our large meetings. Great. Thank you so much to all of you. I really appreciated the tips that you shared. I think one thing that really struck me about the comments that all of you shared is the importance of being intentional as you are managing a remote environment, making sure to have agendas, and notes to over communicate and again and again communicate. Um, the scheduling of formal and both informal time, just acknowledging that people are full, fully formed humans with um, work lives and personal lives that may uh, overlap a little bit more when they are working remotely. Um, so I really appreciated that. Now, before we move on to the next question, before I hand it over to Dan to ask the next question, I'd like to run a quick poll to understand who we have with us today. You've gotten to hear a little bit from our panelists, but now let's let's learn who's uh, who's called in and who's paying attention. So while everyone is filling that in, um, one topic that we discussed with our panelists yesterday uh, was how in a crisis, it's easy for some things to be missed. So it can feel like we're in a sort of a fight or flight mode and we need to get things done and everything started. So as our workplaces adapt, um, it's as important as ever for us to keep our commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. So I'm particularly thinking about how we support people where remote working isn't easy, where it isn't, isn't as simple as just grabbing your laptop uh, and going to a spare room and then scheduling all of your, scheduling all of your meetings. Um, how do we make sure people have access to the devices that they need uh, with the bandwidth that they need to be able to support this? Um, how are we thinking about employees with roommates or employees with kids at home due to closed schools. Um, so Leah and uh, Robin, uh, do you have any thoughts about this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is um, be patient and compassionate um, because you know, you're getting kind of a, a new window into someone's life a little bit um, and that can be amazing but it can also lead to a little bit more disruption and I think a lot of times we have to roll with it like I don't does everyone remember when that um, BBC uh, commentator was speaking and his little kid started like walking through the room like first of all she was awesome that was hilarious but also I mean for me it was like I didn't even bat an eye. It was just like a completely normal thing that I would normally see and expect in, in someone's home. And so many people freaked out online, like it was this crazy thing that happened. And uh, I, I think, you know, having been on these calls at 18 f and um, USDS, like I've seen this a lot and it's just completely normal. And, you know, sometimes things will be a little bit disruptive at the beginning when you're all kind of sorting this out or we're going through a period where a lot of folks have to have their kids at home and, and unexpectedly and um, I think it's fine like think a lot about how 
you might be making comments or little jokes about how there's some noise in the background from a kid or something, but that can kind of add up to making someone feel really self-conscious about their role in the, um, and their contributions on the call. And so um, I try really hard to just roll with it and say it's totally fine and um, just expect that um, things will be a little bit messy while you sort things out, but people will remember when you handle something with grace and, and patience when we're all sorting out a new thing. And I think uh, supporting your team is always far more crucially important than having the absolute most productive meeting at this very moment. Robin? Thanks, Leah. Um, yeah, Robin, so I can imagine, um, or I can imagine a world where it might be slightly easier for organizations, nonprofits, and vendors to be able to adapt um, and to support diversity, equity, and inclusion with policies, perhaps slightly faster than government might be able to. Um, do you have any thoughts about what sort of policies uh, governments at the local, state, and federal level might already have uh, that would support remote working from a practical point of view, like access to devices and bandwidth and so on? Um, what are some what are some hacks or what are some things that might already exist? Well, look, I think we've we've got lots of experimentation going on around the country on this topic already. Uh, many many uh, government workers have laptop computers. Uh, at GSA in particular, there was very much a remote culture beyond 18F, where people maybe one day a week were working from home. So particularly in those instances where there's been some experimentation already uh, in, your, in your government teams to uh, remote work, uh, the idea of ramping that up a little bit uh, should not be that heavy of a lift. So um, I think that in many cases, it doesn't take major new policy uh, drivers or changes. It just takes leadership that's ready to take that step. Uh, I think that what we're gonna be seeing in the coming weeks is going to prove this out, um, that many of these things are already possible. Um, obviously, if there are situations where there's not access to um, uh, high-speed internet, that's going to be problematic for folks, um, and that's going to be a longer-term uh, problem to solve. Um, but in the, in the immediate realm, I think it really is about ramping up some of the practices that folks already have in place. So I know that in some places where I've consulted with government, um, I've seen one or two of the um, wireless LTE hotspots flying around um, when departments realize that they might be going out to a meeting. So perhaps one of the things that can be done is if we could buy two of them, then maybe we can buy a few more for the people who need them. Um, Robin, and, one, one And I would say also, Dan, like, you know, many times your phones have hotspots and it's often more, more common for government workers to have a government phone. So even doing something as simple as, as, as turning that on so that they can have an immediate wireless hotspot is, is a quick uh, solution. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you mentioned was the need for executive leadership to be very clear. Um, are you able to share the kind of things that you would want to hear or the kind of statements or positions that you would recommend exec leadership stake out? sooner rather than later or right now? I think everyone is at, at this inflection point right now, uh, obviously, wanting to keep people safe, both uh, in, their, in their offices and in their communities, and staying home is, is one way to do that. Um, so I think being, being clear about uh, a time frame to do this, being clear about uh, the ability to get this work, conveying that to managers, um, and by the way, a lot of these are just good practices to start. Um, what this forces in terms of management is real prioritization, right? About what work is important, what outcomes and what timelines. Um, and in a way, this is a thing that's super valuable to government anyway. So uh, I think it is gonna, it's gonna take a little bit of a mind shift, uh, but I think long-term this is super healthy uh, for getting governments uh, to, to be able to get the outcomes that we all know that they, that they need. And Mark, so trust, we've talked before uh, when we were prepping about how trust was designed as a remote first organization. 
how does that factor into how you prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion, in, inclusion there? Honestly, our, the, it's, it's backwards. We, we priority is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and therefore must be a distributed first company. Um, like we have, we have employees all, all across the country. Um, and we're constantly trying to make our company look like America. Um, which is hard work. Uh, and, and so what we've, what we've seen, what we do to help with this kind of stuff is um, we normalize that, yeah, if you're working from home, uh, there's gonna be other people that are not in the company that you might see, um, including children, and that's okay. So in, in our all hands meetings, we'll often have um, a handful of, of, you know, we call them littles, you know, handful of littles like in the camera and like people will like wave high and like hold up a sign saying like, you know, hello little one or, or whatever. Um, and so people, especially new employees to the organization see that and, and start to get a sense from, and both from talking to their managers also about, hey, this is okay. Like we, you know, we're working, but you've got people around you. Um, another thing we do is we'll introduce people. Like if we're in a meeting and someone's in there with their roommate or their kid or their family, um, they'll stop and take the time to introduce them to the other people in the meeting sometimes just to be like, hey, like meet my, you know, my mom, my mom is with us today and like, like meet my mom. And, and we'll, we'll do that as a way to just kind of make it okay. I mean, as Leah said, you're, you're getting this, this, this uh, view into people's lives, which is amazing. Um, and it needs to be respected and kind of treated as not just like people behind a pane of glass that you're, that you're looking at. Um, and, and we also make accommodations. Like, like if someone, we, we have a, you know, we have, we, we do use money for this. We have a, a setup budget. We have, um, uh, what we call an employee effectiveness budget, which is which is just like, look, if you think this is going to help you out, it's okay. Like, go ahead and spend a little bit of money, and then report back to the organization if it worked or not. And that way, we kind of develop a shared practice of being good at distributed work, because fundamentally, like, this requires practice. Like, everybody has practiced how to be good at working in an office. Most people, that's been their entire career. And so, when you're working not from an office with each other you have to practice it and, and sharing what works amongst ourselves and giving ourselves permission to use a little bit of money. Our employee effectiveness budget per month is like not very large. It's a, I think we just changed it, but it's, it's on the order of like a hundred bucks or so. Like it's not like everyone's buying second monitors all the time. It's like, I wanna try this to see if it's gonna make my life better. And, and those LTE hotspots that Dan mentioned, they're actually not expensive now. Like they fall into that, that amount of money. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that way, and then, and then sometimes they don't work. And then we're like, okay, cool. This particular headphone that we tried was very bad and nobody should buy it. Or this LTE hotspot worked really well in this state, but doesn't work well in that state. We just kind of try to keep track of that so that when new people join the organization, we can give them this like, hey, here's some stuff that worked for us. Feel free to start here. And then you can adapt it to what works for you. I just want to add on to that because I, I think like the points you made about um, the flexibility it gives people are just so crucial. Like um, even if you, you know, do think like you've practiced that, like being in the office every day and, and your whole team is in the same region and they all go into the office every day, offering the flexibility of remote work has so many uh, ripple effects to make people's lives easier and better that um, I, I don't think people fully realize. I think like having that flexibility of being able to choose when you need to like um, drop off your kids or make an appointment or run an, an important errand, like, but being able to go in and see people at the same time, like having the, that flexibility is like what's so crucial about this. I remember at ATF we had an engineering manager who was able to stay on in that role for much longer because uh, she said that you know, she had morning sickness for a long, well, she was pregnant, she had morning sickness and, and not having to get on the metro every morning and go into the office meant that she was able to do a lot more um, and stick in that role for a lot longer. So I think that there's a lot of ways that we don't even fully appreciate or realize that um, it empower people to live their lives more fully and uh, when they have this kind of flexibility. 
one thing one thing that has come up that I can see in our questions um, is that it can sound like this is easy for organizations that are remote first. So we're hearing from ADNF, we're hearing from NAVA, we're hearing from TRUSS. Um, and I can imagine that we've got people sitting there who say, well, we kind of have to do all of our work in person. Uh, we have a great uh, question from um, someone talking about, well, what if you work on the Hill? What if you work in Congress? And lawmaking is something that's done in person. Uh, I have my own suspicions about how our panelists' answers might go to this. <laughs> um, but um, Leah, um, as someone who's worked in federal government um, at CMS, um, and also with 18F. Um, these are organizations that are very much used to working in person, I imagine, a lot of the time. Um, how do you navigate that shift? Uh, I'm, I've never been at CMS, I've been at VA. Oh, CMS sorry. Is awesome. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's hard. I think um, first that, that point is like, it's, it's always going to be difficult if you don't have that center of gravity towards uh, remote. Um, I think that what I was saying about the flexibility, um, you know, even though we can't, <laughs> that now it's especially tricky to have that, that both, but I think, you know, being able to, like, I go, I, I'm down here in Austin, but I go to DC uh, for a week, a month usually, and uh, have that connection. And sometimes it doesn't even feel like enough. I think that, um, you have to really be diligent about thinking through all the different ways that you would have normally made yourself just physically available or been in touch with people. And, and it's a little bit more work to actually think through and scheduling out and opening yourself up for being available for uh, random coffee times, having slots available, having um, co-working times available um, where, or, or office hours where folks can come in and maybe folks are just collaborating, working, at the same time, but um, there, there's that little bit of, of connection. You need a little bit more of that serendipitous um, opportunity creation. I remember on the, when we were working on the FOIA project at 18F uh, for FOIA.gov, um, towards the end when we were getting really close to shipping, we just kept a window open of video chat all day. Uh, and we were like, why didn't we do this sooner? This is so much better because most people were working or they could mute it if they needed to focus on something, but they were available to chat very quickly. Um, so, I mean, I haven't worked on Capitol Hill though. I'd be curious what maybe Robin or, or Laura have thoughts on that. So I, I, uh, I don't want to speak for folks on the Hill, but for, for, for folks in states and also uh, for elected officials, I will say that, you know, there are a lot of tools that exist already for, you know, online town halls and other kinds of interactive things. Municipalities have been experimenting with this a lot because not everybody wants to go to a municipal meeting. Um, and so they're trying to figure out ways to get constituents feedback in, in an online format. Um, I guess I'd also say, like, I don't see this as a permanent state, right, that we're all going to, like, change Congress to being online. Uh, but like in the interim, I think there are a lot of things that that members can do to intentionally and actively reach out to communities to share information and just to do that uh, with digital tools. So I think there are lots of things that exist. It's just about getting in and getting started. Laura, and there's kind of an opportunity here. Oh, sorry, just real quick. There's kind of an opportunity here to be more explicit, more explicit and public about your availability. Um, which means that it's not just the people who have the ability to like pay for a lobbyist and be on Capitol Hill who are going to bump into you or have those connections. It's kind of a more democratizing approach if, if you're, you know, just doing a, a opening up for questions on Instagram and you have a live feed going or something, then like anyone can participate. And I think um, it's also an exciting opportunity. Yeah, there's nothing keeping members of Congress from doing a Zoom meeting just like this. Absolutely. Um, Laura, anything before we move on? I never worked on the Hill, but I appreciate the thought that I've had. <laughs> All right. So um, what I'm hearing is that while we may feel a little bit like we're living under a crisis at the moment, it's also really important for us to be able to step back and take a breath. Um, I think we're hearing consistently that great re remote work doesn't come for free. It takes being intentional 
Uh, it takes time and practice, and it also takes money. Um, just because we happen, we might happen to have the equipment, um, just because some people who work um, in these ways might happen to have the equipment, doesn't mean it's something where we can just flip a switch. And I think most importantly, one of the things that we're hearing is that as we adapt, we remember to be as compassionate and accommodating about each other's situations as possible. So, Afua. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciated um, the comments in this last section that really addressed uh, the need to be compassionate and accommodating for schedules. I will confess that I skew heavily on the introverted side. So one of the things I think about when people say accommodating and um, showing more of your life because you're working remotely is how do you set boundaries? How do you put a framework around when you will be available, when you won't be available to prevent uh, burnout for yourself? And it looks like we've also received a question along these lines as well. Um, what about people who want to keep their home life private or um, don't want to present themselves all the time? Does everyone have to be on the call at the same time to have an effective meeting? Laura, I want to start with you and get your thoughts. The setting boundaries, um, transitioning to remote can be very trying, um, even when it's not compounded by the anxiety of being on a crisis. And a lot of people will also be dealing not only with the regular work from home need for boundaries, but having their kids at home, having their partner at home, and all sorts of other changes. Um, physically changing your environment in any way when you switch from work time to home time can be very powerful. To the question about what do I do if I don't want to share my home life, something as easily as draping a sheet over something and putting it behind you, and then at the end of your workday, taking that down and making it your home again can, be, can help you with that emotional transition from the work that is your work to the work to the work that, it, sorry, from the life that is your work and the life that is your life. Um, for people who prefer working in an office who are being forced to work remotely right now, um, it can feel like an intrusion in your home. Um, one of the things that uh, Leah talked a little bit about was about flexibility, and that's absolutely critical. For those who don't do this as a matter of course, saying that you're respecting flexibility and then actually respecting it, saying that explicitly to your people will help employees manage their time more competently as they're working around kids or partner at home. Uh, for instance, uh, Nava's watching school closures right now and communicating proactively about it being okay for people's schedules to change because we know that their lives are, have more variables than they would um, under more normal circumstances. Um, a couple of notes for managers specifically, um, depending on how long this goes, and to Robin's point, this is a good practice for all time, um, remember that a day off when somebody's really getting burnt out can prevent weeks or months of real burnout if it goes too far. Also, when you can't see people's, people face to face, um, if you're used to doing that, you have to be more diligent about checking in with people's mental health, specifically when you do your one-on-ones. For people who don't do regular check-ins right now, it would be a good time to start that. And for people who do have regular one-on-ones already, focusing on how people are doing today rather than the normal talk about that and the project and their future career and then actively listening to what it is that they're saying to you will go a long way to keeping your people happy and healthy hopefully healthy great thanks laura i especially liked what you said about not just saying you respect flexibility but actually <laughs> Uh, respecting flexibility. Mark, I'm sure you must have thoughts on this question of how to set boundaries and prevent burnout. Can you share them with us? Sure. Um, one of the things we found that was best for, one of the best boundaries we've set is we we enforce a very strict 40 hour work week. Like, like we talk about it a lot. The founding team shares their calendar with the company sometimes to show that we're like sort of walking our talk. Um, but when people are working from home, it's really easy especially at the beginning to just keep working because it's right there you don't have that transition that like hopefully short commute to to like 
shake it off. Um, and it takes some coaching. Like we have, we generally have to like be like, no, we really mean it. Like, like we need you here and focused for 40 hours a week. And then we don't want you here for the rest of the time. Um, the, the thing that Laura mentioned about um, one-on-ones, that's an incredible, like that's kind of almost, I would, I, I sometimes joke, that's kind of our main management practice at Trust. Like we are very, very like all managers will have one-on-ones that's required um, at a, at a pretty regular frequency, like minor weekly, some managers do, we do between one and two weeks, um, depending on circumstance. And, and you need that kind of check-in period. Um, and you need the ability to like give people a break sometimes. Um, we call it search protection, um, like a, like a circuit breaker. Um, and it's a, and it's a tool. It's a, it's a like, Hey, uh, you had a client deadline. It was it was rough. You've had a, a lot of things happen. Your manager is going to gently insist that you take a day off. That you and it's and we 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 track this and we're 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 making sure that these are being used in an effective fashion. But it's something that we really care about because if it goes on too long, you lose your employee. Potentially for like potentially forever, like they leave or or. Um, they can get sick and there's like a lot of things you want to you you um sorry there's it goes bad it goes bad badly and you want to avoid that fundamentally and the, and there's a, some like extra tensions working from home that i think um uh aren't as common in the office and and fundamentally what it comes down to is that just like never feeling like you've left work and so having a having a good boundary and a good um uh, kind of ritual around that uh, can go a long way. Great. I, Thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I just um, I think you know if if folks back to that original question, like if folks really feel uncomfortable sharing um, and being on video in their home, um, I think that if you're a manager and you're hearing that from a bunch of different people, like I think that that's worth listening to and, and really examining, you know, it might be more about the work culture and um, the office space that you're in and uh, how, why, you know, really dig into why don't people feel comfortable. I mean, if it's just as simple as like, I don't like staring in a mirror on my calls all day long, like that's an understandable thing that folks may just have to kind of adjust to. And um, there can be a lot of benefits. I've learned a lot about like how much you can actually see me nodding and how much I have to like do do it more obviously or something, but um, it is kind of, it is kind of weird at first. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I would, I would, I would respect and, and dig in a little bit more about why folks don't feel uncomfortable because there may be valid underlying reasons that have nothing to do with distributed and remote work to begin with. Afua, the one other thing, if I may, if you offer an employee, employee assistance program, some kind of EAP, a lot of companies do, remind people of that and remind them or encourage them to use it in the same way of saying explicitly, these are hard times, please utilize the tools that are at your disposal to, to normalize it. Uh, one additional tip uh, coming from my Slack channel with my remote workers is um, getting up to do a physical break when you're done with your day. Get up, walk around your block or whatever it is to have a clear delineation in addition to changing your physical environment. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for those very practical tips. I especially love the making sure that you give people a break, whether that's you gently insisting that people take a day off when they need it. And then for yourself and managing your own schedule, setting a reminder, setting something that forces you to get up and move around at the end of the day and really transition from your work life to your home life. Um, See, with just an eye on the time, because I see that we have a lot of great questions coming in, and I want to give us ample time for Q&A. Let me turn it back over to Dan right now. So I know that we said that we weren't really going to do this, um, but I would like to run a very quick question with our panelists, um, with no more than 10 seconds for each answer, which is, what sort of collaboration software are you using at the moment? Um, Laura, would you like to go ahead? Or I'm going to ask you to go ahead first. We use Slack, uh, Zoom, and collaborative tools. Ours is Google Drive, but there are a lot of options out there. Uh, 
a note for people who work with government clients, there are a host of tools that are already FedRAMP, which makes it very easy to have that conversation with your clients or stakeholders. Um, I'm sure a list will be linked. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mark, you're up next. We also use Slack, Zoom, G Suite. We also use tools like Miro and Figma for our design groups. And we use GitHub for our engineering groups very heavily. Uh, and then Leah and Robin, you both get bonus points if you're able to not include Slack and Zoom and G Suite in your answers. I've got one. Uh, we use Trello pretty regularly at 18F, uh, as well as Mural. Leah, you get the, you get the hardest one now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, all those. Um, the VA is now uh, doing the uh, Microsoft Cloud, but our contractors use Google Docs, so uh, I'm sometimes switching in between those. Um, obviously, I have a preference. But um, uh, maybe I'll say something about additional, like I have, you know, 20 different Slack channels running at one time. So I'm keeping up with people, you know, not just in my office, but in the broader space and reaching out to them. Um, Twitter, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time searching Twitter for good comments or ideas about um, how to do remote work or um, clever takes on mocking that. It can be difficult. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop. But, I, but, but unfortunately, there's not a ton of um, alternative tools right now that are equally good. OK, and um, my very last question before we move to Q&A um, is that, again, in government context, I can imagine that if there are tools that you would like to be using but are currently not using, um, it can sometimes be difficult to get them through a regular procurement cycle. Um, I can imagine that being able to point to something being FedRAMP certified or knowing that, well, knowing that you can say, well, if the DOD uses it, then why can't it be good enough for us to use it? Um, Robin, um, with your state and local practice at 18F, do you have any quick thoughts about tactical uh, and candid either procurement hacks or, or ways to uh, speak with someone like a CSO or a procurement officer about how to get the tools uh, that you need um, to successfully work together? Yeah, that's a terrific question because even if you wanna do this, sometimes it's, it's blocked to adopting these tools or maybe there's some enterprise tool that's already being used that's being paid for. Um, so, I think now is in this moment where we have everybody's attention about the value and the need for remote work is the time to get your leadership's attention on this topic. Being able to make the case about which of these tools are being used and have been authorized and security proofed by the Department of Defense and these other federal agencies. That's if you don't know what FedRAMP is, it's basically the list of um, products and, and platforms that have gone through very extensive security uh, screenings by the federal government and there are different levels of FedRAMP approvals. And so it really is an easy way to present to your leadership team that these are well vetted and documented things that aren't going to cause a particular security problems. So um, uh, that's, a, that's a really big deal. In terms of the procurement itself, obviously cost is a big factor. Some of these tools are free or, or sort of small cost to get started. So look at those first. Uh, and secondly, many of them are um, uh, services, right? So the, they, the cost to get into them is actually quite a lot lower and often what can come in below your procurement thresholds, right? That require lots of uh, extensive documentation and time. So check if it's free, that's the first thing. And number two, check and see if you can get one that is uh, billed as a service so that it's much cheaper to get started. And by the way, we'll, we'll give a link to the FedRAMP um, uh, website so that you can take a look at that and see what tools are already there uh, that you can present to your leadership and, uh, see, uh, and uh, security officers. 
So I know we are running short on time. We did have a fun thing that I that um, Afua and I thought that we would do uh, before we moved to Q and A, and um, we were debating whether to run it or not. But I think we should go for it. I think we definitely should go for it. Um, all right. So for each of our panelists, um, if you could just leave our um, our attendees today with a six word story about how to work remotely well, what would it be? And um, we'll talk for another 30 seconds to give you some time to think about it. And then after you respond, we'll go through a few of the questions that have been submitted. Um, Leah, I'm going to start with you. A six word story. Six word story. Have a routine and <laughs> take more breaks. <laughs> That'll work. Have a routine and take more breaks. <laughs> um, Mark, how about you? For video chat, update your router firmware. Very practical. I like it. Robin? It's not about the tech. Does Robin get a bonus one because she only used three words? Oh, Indeed. Wait, four words. I know. A three word story. I like it. Um, and Laura, we'll close out with you. Communicate deliberately and create a workspace. Ooh, I like that. Work Communicate space. deliberately and create a workspace. Thank you so much, panelists. And Dan, if you want to um, ask a few of the questions that we've gotten, I see that we have gotten a lot of questions. We won't be able to get through them all. Um, but um, yes, let's address what we can. All right, so first up um, for Robin, I think, uh, we've had a couple of questions about organizations that are not proponents, or maybe let's go so far as to say they've been historically hostile to remote work. Um, how, how would you recommend talking to them and how would you go about convincing managers? What kind of things would you say or what kind of arguments would you put forth? Uh, to convince managers and organizations to get on board? Uh, well, for, look, people just need to turn the television on. Uh, this is <laughs> managers, if they want to have productive work teams, they're going to have to figure this out. So that's number one. I don't think there's a lot of convincing that's going to take place. The question is how to be effective in it. And I think the effectiveness is going to be uh, about having the management teams be thoughtful about what's important and what the priorities are communicating those things. And then even though I said it's not about the tech, it's about getting some of those tools in place so that people can actually use them. Um, and that's where, you know, things like the FedRAMP uh, list that shows what's already been uh, able to be secured and how you can get those products for free. If you can walk in the room and say, we have secure tools that we can get at free or low cost that can help our teams collaborate and we can help with some best practices it's gonna be hard for leadership right now to say no to that. Great, thank you, Robin. Um, I have what is what I suspect is gonna be a very quick and easy question to answer uh, for Laura and Mark, which is, do you find that offering remote work allows uh, work that allows employees to stay in their own community? Do you find that that helps recruit high quality workers that are in high demand? Absolutely. I think I'll put it, <laughs> I'll put it this way, when I talk to my friends who don't do this, they have recruiting problems and I do not. That is a brilliant answer from both of you. Thank you very much. All right, next up, I also have uh, this one for Laura, Mark and Leah. Um, or actually, sorry, just Laura and Mark. So when you're a group, when you're a group of people who are working with external clients rather than with your internal team, how does that negotiation go about when, in terms of agreeing with tools or dealing with mismatched uh, access to tools? Uh, Laura, you first. I'm sorry, could you repeat the last half? <laughs> <laughs> so when, when, you are, when you're working with clients, um, how do you go about negotiating which tools you're going to use and, um, and how you're going to um, go about using them or how do you agree on the tools that you, you need to work? It's always a balance between what it's worth trying to replace and what it's, well, um, and what's not worth it, what's worth integrating with instead. But I will say that um, it's not about the tools, like solving the, 
figuring out what you need to solve the problem that you need to solve first has to be the first conversation before you start discussing what you're going to use to solve it. So starting the communication about what do we need to be able to do before discussing specific technologies is how we have that conversation. Yeah, we, we have conversations like this really early in our sales process, like when we initially begin to engage with clients. Um, and generally, our approach is we meet people where they are. Um, we don't, uh, we will, we will if, if they're very committed to a certain tool set, um, we will start using that. What we find is we work with people as they express frustration, if they are expressing frustration with their tool set, they tend to migrate towards our tool set because um, we offer it as an alternative. And then, you know, a meeting doesn't work and we like, well, let's try, we're using Zoom. Why don't we try that? And they start using it and they're like, oh, okay. And these things kind of expand um, throughout the duration of our engagement with them. Um, we don't convert everything. And, and I think it's for us to do the work that we wanna do, it's very, very important that we're meeting the organizations that we are working with where they are. Yeah, not spending a lot of cycles on trying to change the, the underlying tools, but instead focusing on the new work that, get, that needs to get done. Um, another good argument to Robin's point from earlier is that if something is free or less expensive, that can also be a compelling argument. All right, thanks both. Um, um, sorry, go ahead, Leah. I was just going to say, I, uh, sometimes there's a tiny bit about the tools, like, um, although I, I very much appreciate Laura's point, um, but something I, I hate, like not to endorse Zoom, but like a, a tool that degrades gracefully so that, um, you know, like I'm called in on the line in case my Wi-Fi goes down folks can call in there are like different options for participating in the zoom call like um that can be really helpful if you're trying to corral a, a big group across government together um and i also think that um I want more companies that uh, have a strong opinion about um, what they need to get their job done and bring those tools already. Like I don't want um, companies that are willing to just do whatever uh, a government person says if it undermines their ability to get their work done. Uh, I think that's important as uh, maintaining the quality of your work. All right, um, we are two minutes out. So I'm gonna do one last question um, and I'll go to Leah first. Um, how do you help your remote employee, remote only employees feel connected with the culture? And we have a related question here, which was what about coffee bots and virtual happy hours? Um, we also discussed this as a group yesterday. So I would love to hear very, very quick closing thoughts from you all um, about building culture and building a little bit of fun um, and uh, helping kind of create that sociability. Yeah, I think, you know, you start by working out like the basics, the table stakes, the tools, and then you start by, you know, making sure that your standard management, good management practices like one-on-ones fit into those and are easy to do distributed. And then you build on that by building in the culture. And I think, you know, you have to be really deliberate about like all the times of the day that you might've been available by the water cooler or walking around or times you might've been willing to just randomly get a coffee with someone and plan those out ahead of time and then um, have random channels that have nothing to do with work that are about affinity or having kids or distributed or, you know, that kind of thing um, is it really crucial and important and you need to not focus so much on like every single thing needs to be work related in the work channel. Yeah, I was shocked when I got to 18F to see all of the non project related channels um, and, and, uh, <laughs> It, it, it's, it's funny, uh, but it does change the culture of an organization because it lets you have these groups of people and have conversations about things you care about, whether it's cats or dogs or horses or learning Spanish or whatever it is. So I think that's a really great thing. Uh, the virtual happy hours obviously are, are after hour things that are completely uh, uh, you know, optional for folks. But it's great because it's a chance to like just have a communication with the people that you're working with every day. Um, the one other thing that we do that's a lot of fun is at the end of our all hands, we do a thing called pets and kids, where everybody like 
either has them show up on camera or shows a picture of a pet or a kid. And it's always kind of the favorite part of, uh, of all of the meetings. So um, there are lots of things you can do to create a culture that's inclusive uh, when it comes to uh, working remotely. Great. And I see that we are now officially out of time. Um, we'll stay on for a couple more minutes, but I understand that some people have to run. Just want to thank you all for joining us today and experiencing this new summit format with us. Again, please stay connected to each other and look out for additional content from Code for America in the coming months. And as I mentioned, we'll stay on for a couple of more minutes to go through a couple of more um, responses and questions. Thank you, you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you very, very much to Laura, Mark. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous plant pet. Um, thank you very much to Laura, Mark, Leah, and Robin. And um, I think we hadn't heard from uh, Mark or Laura yet um, about um, those social parts. And I see that uh, we've had a few mentions about the donut tool. We use the donut tool. It helps. Um, it's also, we found it's good to get creative about the, you know, people talk about like coffee and, and, and kind of cocktails. Um, we tend to downplay, we tend to downplay cocktails at Trust a little bit. Uh, and so what some folks got going is a, is a monthly, we call it a craft together where people will just call into, a, a zoom and some people are knitting. We're not all doing the same craft. So some people are knitting. Um, I did one where I was conmarrying my my uh, my drawer, that was a big hit. Um, and you know everyone else is is making stuff. Um, and just having space, like making it okay for your organizational resources to be used for these ways to build the organizational community together, and just making sure people know that that's okay from a leadership level is really, really important. It'll be no surprise that I bring it that communication is the underpinning of culture as well. Uh, we also do the Slack channels that are related to interests. Um, one of my favorites are those that um, encourage people to have regular interactions. We have a group of people taking an ASL course that get together once, uh, once a month for a uh, lunch, which is entirely done in ASL. <laughs> um, we have a daily habits channel where people check in to say what they're doing on their on their daily habit goals. And my personal favorite is one called Papers We Love, where people post academic papers that they then have a structured um, discussion around. But it's not just Slack. You can communicate in a variety of ways. For those of us who live in the same city or around the same city, even though we work remotely, we occasionally get together and co-work. There are three people who live near the Chicago area, which is where I, where I work out of. And so on occasion, we get together and just sit together and work on our regular, uh, work on whatever we're doing. Same place, different work. And uh, we have our weekly huddle, of course, where everybody gets together, which I believe we shamelessly stole part of 18F's approach, which is starting with a stretch and ending with a joke. And so that leaves everybody at the end of the week in a good place and feeling that sense of camaraderie with the rest of the team. Thank you all. Um, if we are happy with keeping going, we can also keep going. Um, one, one question that came up that I thought was pretty interesting and also, well, not interesting, um, incredibly relevant, um, is around people who are not as digitally savvy. Um, and also people who do not have access to video. So let's do the, um, let, let's do the one about people who aren't as digitally engaged. Um, how, how have you all found uh, bringing these people into the fold, making them feel safe, making them feel accepted um, and part of the team? I imagine that it is equally likely and easy for people to feel excluded if they're not familiar with these tools. Um, who would like to take that one first? Leah? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think um, kind of like what I was saying at the beginning about um, practicing stuff ahead of time, like we had a working group at 18 s that was available for that and folks who felt a little bit more uncomfortable with some of the tools while we were in the process of figuring out, making them work for everyone, they could tune in and work through some of the kinks and um, have some of the feedback or advice on how to do that stuff. I think, um, yeah, it's important to include everyone. 
I would, Mark, I would um, add, oh. like, in addition to making sure folks like know how to use stuff and are comfortable and aren't embarrassed to ask. Um, uh, the other thing is if you're on a call and they're it's sort of the, the job of the person leading the meeting to try to get information out of people and get everybody to speak. So my, the way I do that and a lot of folks at 18F is you pay attention to who's doing the speaking and if folks haven't spoken up to like specifically say, I'd like your opinion about this or can you give us some thoughts and not in a, not in putting people on the spot way, but to try to, because sometimes people don't speak because they don't think their voice, they, anybody wants to hear their voice. And so making sure that you want to hear from everyone is important. I love Robin's point about putting, um, making part of the responsibility of facilitating a meeting to be making sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate. To this question, there is also something Mark said to me yesterday, which was, you meet people where they are. Um, Mark, I'm not going to steal your thunder on that. It was, it was a great phrase, but if what people have are calling, uh, like just phones, then you use phones. Um, if all they have is emails with attachments, then you use emails with attachments. The communication, again, is the most important part. You can iteratively get better as people get more comfortable. In, in our experience also, it's not just folks. Like there's, like you think like, okay, well, I mean, Trust is a software company. We still train everybody. Like we have, a, we have an onboarding process, like just that this is a new way of working for a lot of people. And compassion is the order of the day and showing people how to use the tools and walking through with them. Um, a lot of our managers do in their first one-on-one, -on -one, which is like on the employee's first day, which remember is distributed. Like they haven't met anybody in person. Part of that time is like, hey, do you know how to use the tool? Like, do you want to like play with this tool in a, in a place where it's just two people? And like, here's how you can do this thing. Did you know you can do that? It's, it's just all about making it, making it okay to learn how to use this new way of working and making it okay for people to ask the question of like, hey, on this conference call, how do I mute my phone? Like, what do I need? Like, do, how do I mute and unmute, right? And then, and then that makes the whole environment work better for everybody. I can imagine also having totally like I can imagine the totally fun mute and unmute party where tens of people get on and practice muting and unmuting at the same time. And uh, we all do it on purpose as opposed to accidentally. Uh, Leah. Um, I was also having channels in Slack specifically dedicated to help, like help desk. Um, I think, you know, you can, people who are interested in providing advice will join that Slack and happily answer questions and, um, having an opportunity for folks to ask a you know range of questions like how do i find this thing related to hr versus it, and all the way through like my stupid computer's not working um which i encounter quite a lot um it can be a really helpful like low lift way of offering that support thanks leah um okay very very last question i promise um and this one I feel ties in with our topic of setting boundaries and working healthily uh, and also dealing with organizations or working with organizations that are new um, to working remotely and issues like presenteeism. So do any of our panelists have thoughts about how an organization or management can balance trust and accountability when their employees and coworkers are remote? So this is the perennial um, you're working remote and I'm imagining you're actually at home on Netflix. Um, who wants to go first? I'm going to pick Laura. Make sure that you're measuring the right things when you're determining what people are doing and it's not the number of hours they're working. <laughs> All right, that's yes. great from Laura. That's an awesome point. I just like if yeah if, <laughs> if you can't trust your employees to do work then that's not a remote work problem that's a larger problem and like it probably isn't like just a non-issue if they're in the office like maybe they don't know what the top priority they should be working on is or they hate the work that you've assigned them and you should consider adjusting um, 
So let's, so, so there's two ways that we can do this. I can ask you what are the things to be measuring or what are the things to be looking for, or, and sometimes I find this more fun, what are the worst things that you could possibly measure? Uh, or what are some of the worst things that you've seen to measure um, or to uh, measure trust and accountability? Pick, pick either one. Velocity, physical presence in an <laughs> office. I mean, you know, like what we were saying about the doing, like you do a one-on-one -on -one with someone and you check in with them and you prioritize, like, are they getting things done and accountable to their team? Um, these are good practices, whether you remote or not. Yeah, and Mark? I, in terms of worst, um, something that I've seen in orgs that when they've, when they've started to have distributed employees is treat like their IM status as like their butt in the seat time and getting really upset if somebody closes down the chat session to focus. Um, so don't do that. And that was actually something that came up in our, in our prep yesterday was making sure that people set aside focus time in their calendars and make sure that there are times when, when you're not available uh, when you're using something like Slack. I see Laura nodding incredibly vigorously. I think that's especially important with remote work because people can't tell when you're in the middle of something. If you're in an office, you can put your headphones on to say that it's your work time. Nobody knows that when they don't see you in person. Great. And um, Robin, is there anything you would like to add on this topic? I just feel like it always, it, it, everything goes back to over communicating and being clear about the outcomes that you want um, and the, the expectations and deadlines. I just, you know, if, if you get that part right, uh, then people are going to tend to deliver and try to do that. If that's mushy, people are going to fill their time in other ways. So it's really up to the leadership team with the rest of the team to prioritize and, and make sure they're focused on the right things. So thank you very, very much. Um, we are now 13 minutes over, um, and I see that we still have a good 85 people um, listening in and watching along. So thank you very, very much for sticking along with us. Um, stay tuned for the recording of this session. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask that um, CFA get it ready as soon as possible so that we can share it with you as well as the resources that we've been pulling together and the links that we've been discussing in chat, uh, because it sounds like some of you are very eager to get it in front of your executive leadership as soon as possible. Um, so again, thank you to Laura, Mark, Leah, and Robin, and to my wonderful co-chair, Afua. Uh, thank you also very much to Marissa and Javita, who have been running marketing's marketing and event management, who I'm sure everyone can imagine have been having a very, very difficult time over the last week. Thank you very, very much to Marissa and Javita. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing you at our next online summit session. Thanks very much. Have a great day, everyone.